All right, welcome everyone. If you guys are out there, um, we're going to be starting in a little bit here. I thought I'd try and put some images up here for you guys to see. Uh, we're going to be stuck in the same image. It's oh, a no. pretty one though. Okay, good. Um, can you guys see the pictures good? Looking good, boss. All right. Now, and do you guys see us all on the side, right? Yes. Yeah. Cool. So people joining us, hopefully you guys um, are doing great today. Um, we've got our crew here ready to um, chat it up and talk a little bit about Cabernet. Um, I, what I understand is some of you um, might be seeing a slideshow of, of um, pictures. Um, and last time we did this, some people weren't able to see the pictures. So um, if not, then you're just getting to hear us. And so we might put a little bit of music on to kind of fill in the space. But um, settle in, make sure you guys have some wine, um, pour yourself a big, big, luscious glass of wine, um, whatever you guys prefer, um, and get settled in, and we'll be entertaining you here shortly. That's a cool shot. So that's the oak tree at the top of the hill, for those of you who can't see it. <laughs> you guys are just joining us. Um, we're going to get started in a little bit. So um, we've got the crew here uh, ready to welcome you. And we're looking forward to chatting a little bit about having any coming on today. Um, we have the 15, 2015, 2016 Cabernet that Justin is tasting and talking about. So if you're wanting to join us specifically, then crack open a bottle of those. Um, and if you don't have it, then whatever wine you have is great. Mm -hmm. We have a treat today. We have um, Carol Ann James joining us. She is our assistant wine maker. And so you can come on out and join us on this tasting. And just to remind everyone out there, um, you guys can see us, but we can't see you. So um, don't worry about how you look and, or what you're saying. You guys can chat it up all you want at home. Um, we can't hear you or see you, um, but we can see the um, questions that you ask. So go to the bottom of your screen and the Q&A section. And if you have questions for us, um, please, please ask them. So if prefer to have questions, so... Um, questions about the winery, questions about anyone on staff, about the winery dogs, um, anything you guys want to talk about. Um, we're here to entertain you and, um, and hopefully give you guys a little bit of, um, of a fun afternoon on this Friday after a very, very, very long week. So the sound, I think might be a little mess, but hopefully we're getting too low today. We'll give it a couple more minutes to have people join us. I do have music playing. I tried just what I needed. So I think it was Friday and wine was just what we all needed after a long week. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take requests. So next time you want to hear something different, let me know. But, you know, a little bit of cars is good. I don't know how many millennials we have, but for those millennials, it's just the cars. <laughs> All right, so we're going to start here in a couple of minutes. Um, hopefully people are joining. Um, welcome, everyone. Um, we're going to get started in a sec here. Um, some of you might be able to see um, scrolling pictures on your screen. Those are pictures of the winery. Um, and some of you Karen, I don't think they can hear you over the music. What was that? Your, your instructions, nobody can hear you over the music. Ah, okay, well then I want to stop. You're giving the instructions on what to do on their screens. Oh, no, no need. I'm just turning the music off. <laughs> so um, I am going to kind of get us started. So hopefully, um, People have joined us and um, I'm going to toggle out of here 
and stop sharing my screen. Hi, everyone. <laughs> um, oh, great. It looks like we've got some participants out there. Um, we've got a handful of you guys. And we've already got some questions coming out, which is fantastic. Um, and um, please, if you guys um, notice on your screen, um, down below, there's a Q&A, click on, and um, it's a great place to, um, to ask questions. So um, what we really want is, um, we wanna be here to answer your questions while we're talking about um, Cabernet. Um, we are welcome to entertaining any kinds of questions that you guys might have. So, um, so if you have questions about the winery, if you have questions about Jeff, questions about different varietals, um, whatever you want, um, that's what we're here for. Um, but we are gonna be tasting our um, 15 and 2015, 2016 um, Mount Beater Cabernet. Jennifer has got um, a bottle in front of her. Um, oh, quality control, Karen. Quality control. <laughs> you know, your pouring skills, though, I noticed the drip on the front. I just, you know. Stop it. That's a secret. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, um, so if you have, um, if you have any, either of those wines, if you have any, um, Fontanella Cabernet, that's great. Um, even if you don't have Fontanella Cabernet, if you have a red wine, you're drinking Cabernet, or you know what, even if you're drinking Chardonnay, I really won't, I won't know, so it doesn't matter. Um, but as long as you're having fun and, um, and we're hoping that you've logged in to join us, um, because you're like all of us do for a little break in, um, in what's otherwise a kind of stressful time for all of us. Um, and, and we hope we can bring a little levity to uh, the end of your Friday. So, um, so welcome everyone. So glad so many of you could join us. Um, I think, um, I know some of you, many of you were here last week and um, if you came back and um, that's a good sign, that means we did something right. So thank you for coming again. <laughs> um, and for those of you who are new, um, thanks for joining us. This is our second um, virtual wine tasting. Um, and we have our, um, our crew here, um, which I'm going to, in a second, I'm going to go through and introduce everyone. Um, and one of the things that people really wanted to um, hear about was a little bit more about um, everyone who works here. So we've got some, we've got some questions for everyone. So you get a chance to know our crew a little bit more. Um, one of the things that we have special this time is we also have Carol Ann James joining us. She's our assistant maker. You can wave which one she is. <laughs> um, but we'll club. once we go through and introduce everyone. So um, one other thing is um, what worked last week fairly well was we had um, these polls that would pop up and ask questions um, that you could answer. Um, unfortunately, I found out that there is a handful of people um, that don't see the polls. Um, it's They're just for fun, so it's not that big of a deal if you don't see it. But um, if a poll pops up, then um, you can answer the questions and it's just kind of a fun little way um, to interact, get interactive um, in the process. So and you can tell us the truth, it's anonymous. So don't hold back. That's true, we don't know who, who answers what, so you can kind of answer whatever you want. <laughs> um, all right, so let's meet the crew. Um, I'm Karen Fontanella. Um, I am the founder, co-founder of Fontanella Family Winery, along with my amazing husband, Jeff. Um, Jeff is liquid. I am paper. Um, my background is, um, is in law, so I'm a lawyer with a business degree, and so that's why he makes me do all the paper. Um, but Jeff is an enologist, and, um, and he likes to drink, so he handles all the liquid. So, do you want Fair to say <laughs> Oh, that's some introduction. Thanks, Karen. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everybody. Happy Friday. Thanks for joining us again. Um, this will be really fun. These are two of the best vintages um, uh, of the decade. So I'm looking forward to tasting with everyone. Awesome. Thank you, Jeff. All right. So uh, like I said, I want to introduce everyone and kind of go in a little bit deeper to find out a little more about um, everyone on staff here. So I'm going to start with um, Jennifer Owen. Jennifer is our wine club, ma uh, wine club um, manager. What am I? What am I? Who are you? <laughs> um, I'm really director of sales. So um, some of you have met her, talked to her, interact with her. Um, she gets you her wine, your wine club wine. And so she's a very important person in your life, I know. Um, and so um, one of the things that Jennifer wanted to share was um, how she um, started working at Fontanella. I did want to share that. And I also would like to share that if you hear weird snorting noises during my time, it's not because of me. It's because I'm holding down the office with um, Dolly Parton, the bug, which is Paige's dog, who's a snorter. So the story I want to tell involves um, two Fontanella characters that many of you probably know, A, Jackie Middleton, who worked here for a number of years, and B, Burt Reynolds, 
my ride or die. So I moved to Napa six years ago, single gal with just my dog, and I wanted to go wine tasting at places that I could take expert. So the Napa Valley Vintners has this great um, feature where you can sort all the wineries by different um, features, and one of them is dog friendly. So I literally was working my way down the alphabet. Um, I got to Fontanella. I just thought it was so beautiful. Um, and I met Jackie and I really liked Jackie and I decided I was going to make her be my friend. So I just started to come up and hang out pretty often. And when she uh, was ready to transition to her next move, I was like, will you please, please, please give my resume to Karen Fontanella? She did. And Karen Fontanella called me and invited me in for an interview. And during this interview, she asked me the first thing. It was like 11 o'clock on a Friday, Karen. I don't know if you remember this. I was so nervous. I sweat all through my cardigan. And um, the first thing you asked me is if I wanted a glass of Chardonnay. And I was like, oh, shit. Like, is that a trick question? Because this is a job <laughs> interview, but it's also a winery. And like, yeah, I really want a glass of Chardonnay. But is that unprofessional? But that was six years ago in August. And it's been the best experience of my life and the best job I've ever had. Oh, that's so sweet. <laughs> <laughs> and yes, I remember offering you wine. No, it was, well, the trick question was that you had to say yes. If you didn't want it, then I don't know. See, thank God I figured it out. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thanks, Jen. All right. Next, um, let's meet Carol Ann James. Um, Carol Ann's our assistant winemaker. I'm recently married. And um, she's been with us how long now, Carol Ann? Two years now. Two years now. All right. Um, and so, um, you know, Carol Ann is like such a sweetheart, but I love, this is like one of my favorite stories. So um, I want you to share with us what has been your most awkward moment on the job. <laughs> I love this story. Don't mess it up and make me tell it for you. <laughs> <laughs> so um, it, it's definitely one day in the, the shamefully recent past. Um, <laughs> was when we had some uh, some fancy barrel coopers come in and I did a tasting for them and I was super nervous, um, also sweating through my clothes and um, got, got really nervous and we were, you know, it was kind of going well, but I was just, you know, very, very uh, reserved and the one of the guys was, you know, trying to, you know, pull me out of my shell and he goes, he goes, you know, so um up here you know how's that how's the asset up here and i said oh yeah you know our site um no, no shortage of acid and tannins we have and I, i'm like thinking in my head like am i yoda like <laughs> why is this weird syntax and they just like like we're just like blank stares okay <laughs> well that's awesome so we have yoda on staff which is always nice <laughs> Um, so that's Carol Ann. Thank you for sharing that story. It's one of our favorite <laughs> stories that we get. <laughs> um, so next we have Rachel Bowers, who um, has been with us for, oh gosh, how many years now, Rachel? Gosh, it's been just over five. It's been a while, too. Amazing. She's our angel trades, and so she's frozen. I'm hoping your internet today. Can you hear us, Rachel? Barely. Okay. So we'll, we'll, we'll hopefully it'll, there, there she is. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, let you know right here. But woo, she's back. Okay. So, um, so the question for you is what is your favorite part about doing wine tastings at Fontanella? No. Oh, okay. So beyond getting to share all of our beautiful wines with everyone, I think what I like most is just learning more about people's lives. I think my two favorite questions are how did you meet if we get couples? which are always fun stories, lots of little cute meet cutes, meeting at an ice cream shop for one, um, school dances, and then also knowing what other cool jobs everybody has. I've met people who work with baboons specifically. I've met engineers who work on submarines, um, and it's just really cool to figure out other people's lives. Awesome. <laughs> well, thank you for sharing. We love having you out in the patio and greeting all of our guests and and getting to know more about them as well. Um, all right, great. So um, last we have Paige Smith. Um, Paige is our tasting room manager. Um, so many people out there have I've seen Paige when they've come and um, they've been tasting on the patio. So, um, so Paige, um, I don't know how many of you guys know this, but Paige actually grew up um, just a couple doors down from us. So she grew up on Partrick Road. Um, that's the road that the winery is on. So we have a dead end road called Partrick Road. That the winery is on in Napa. Um, and um, we wanted to know from you, Paige, have you ever encountered the infamous 
Partridge. Ooh. Rebobs. The Rebobs. So the legend goes here in Napa for all the locals that there is these carnivores flying monkeys that reside at the top of Partridge Road and they are protecting the cemetery to any wayward passengers. And so if you go up there, they will basically like eat your brains and hang you from the tree. So I was thrilled when Karen and Jeff created this Rebob Red, this Zinfandel Red blend after these like mythical creatures on my road. I was like, yes. Um, so I am thrilled. I think we just put it up live on, on the website now, correct? Yes, it's there. And then do you, um, like, give, what's the legitimacy of this Rebob Red? Like oh, so they are these flying carnivorous monkeys and they protect the cemetery. Um, and so if you were to go up there, you could, they could scare you. I have never seen one, thank God. However, we were on Mythbusters, so we've got some street cred. I believe it was undetermined, <laughs> which basically means, yes, it's real. <laughs> exactly. Once you're on Mythbusters, you're good. You're golden. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, so I, I see. Thank you so much, Paige. Um, and um, I just, you guys are a asking tons of questions, which is great. Um, I did want to take one moment because one of the questions that came out um, before we kind of move on was, um, I think, a great question. Um, Jack Klunder, um asks us, um, economy collapse, earthquakes, fires, and now COVID-19. Um, what else can you guys go through? Um, it's an amazing story that you guys um, have gone through. And so I, uh, the reason why that one jumped out at me is because I can't help but keep thinking about um, all of these things that we've been through and, um, and how no matter what, like life, life will go on. And, um, and with everything, I, I think um, we just happen to have gone through these particular things that a lot of you have watched us go through. Um, but it's no different than things that go on in everyone's individual lives. Like there's things that happen in everyone's lives um, that are significant in your life and, and challenges that you all go through. But, um, but I think resilience um, and, um, and having a great attitude and be sur being surrounded by, by great people um, has been the strength that we derived from all of it. And so I think when, you know, when you think about this current situation, which is, is the most most broad, widespread um, disaster that we've ever been through. Um, I have so much optimism because I know we can get through it and I know um, that everyone's challenged, but um, you know, at the end of the day, like it, there's gonna be life after this and, um, and we have wine to drink. So, <laughs> and we will continue making wine for you to drink. So. Amen, sister. <laughs> so cheers to that. Cheers. <laughs> And, um, and with that, um, I wanted, I, one of the questions people had had um, after our last session was that they wanted to see what was going on at the property. So um, before we got into Jeff and into the tasting, we thought we'd put on the page cam and, and show people um, the vineyard and the um, patio and kind of, so people can get on smell right now. So Paige, can, we, uh, can you share with us what's happening? Live on the page cam. Yes. Let me, let me flip this camera around and I'll show you guys what's happening behind us. There we go. We've got some bud break happening here with the estate tab. These babies just coming into play. Um, let's see. We're going to come right on up. And this is what we are missing, seeing your beautiful faces here on the patio. So we've had some good rainfall and the pond is looking really good. Page is short, so the page cam should have a better view. There we go. Coming on up. Let's see. I'm gonna take you guys to the to the tasting room patio. I think you all would recognize the beautiful view. Let's see, there's our big cellar doors. I'm going to take you guys on a sneak peek inside. We'll check on that sleeping baby wine and the barrel room. Here's our little Fontanella 2018 Cabernet Sauvignon. This is our Mount Veeder. They're looking really good. Let's see. And then here's the patio. We've been so honored to host all of you. What? 
Karen, did you leave me an Easter egg? Don't mind if I do. Oh, cheers, everybody. We miss you. I'm going to take the beautiful seat on the patio, and you can just live vicariously through me at the moment. <laughs> awesome, Paige. Thank you so much for sharing. <laughs> So we can't wait to have all of you guys back out on our patio. Our, our, the main event, um, I know most of you have logged on because you want to hear Jeff. And so, <laughs> um, so we are going to pass it over to Jeff. Don't nod your head. I'm not going to you. You have to talk. <laughs> um, I have so, Carol Ann here. Do I have to talk? I'm, do I'm done. I just get to drink now. <laughs> Y'all did not give me proper warning. <laughs> Um, so like I said, we're going to be doing Cabernet, so um, we're going to hand it over to Jeff. Please pass your questions along. We'll be peppering them with questions, and um, so please um, ask away. And here you go, Jeff. Okay, so real quick back to where Paige was in the vineyard. Um, just uh, We're just starting bud break. Some of the blocks that are a little more um, exposed with the sunshine and everything are a little farther ahead than what she had shown there, but things are just waking up. It's spring. By next week, those shoots will be probably two to four inches long and will be thinning. And so we'll start to really see uh, the positions and the type of crop that's developing. So this, this time of year is pretty, uh, uh, pretty special. Bud break is pretty neat. So it's the first time we get to see what's going to happen and we really start get the get the wheels turning on the next vintage and all. Um, and as well, just to go backwards, Paige kind of showed a picture there of a mature vine. So that, that vines in its um you know let's see here it's in its seventh year so, so this will be its eighth harvest or, or sorry eighth leaf coming up um i believe yeah so we planted in 12 so we're going to count that as eight seven or eight depends on who's counting but um next door we're just getting to train out positions so we've got the new acreage around the cave that people have been kind of watch it grow up out of the, the small tubes and now it's all out the wire so um, hopefully, when we get back into regular uh, visitation, we'll be able to see kind of how how the uh, uh, the vineyards are kind of encompassing the whole uh, landscape and the whole horizon line. So it's really starting to come together. We're going to get a lot of really good fruit off the cave vineyards this year as well. So we're we're really looking forward to all the different clones and working with all of the uh, design elements that we we started uh, putting in the ground in 2012. So. Um, lots of cool stuff happening on the ranch still. Uh, Cabernet. Can I here? Right, Jeff, can I pause yeah. you for a minute? A question we've gotten a couple times in this Q&A and the last one is folks are wondering what the update on the cave is. I don't know if we want to pass that to your better half. I, other than rebob storage, it's, what is it, Karen? <laughs> At this point in time, it's rebob storage. <laughs> oh, it's a hideout, yeah. Um, yeah, it's a great place for a 10 year old to have a, um, a Nerf gun war. <laughs> no, so, um, so what um, Jen's referring to is that we bought the property next door. It's a 55 acre parcel um, and it has an existing cave that's been drilled, um, but it has not been completed. So um, really first and foremost, we wanted to plant the vineyard. So it has um, the possibility for at least 21 acres of vineyard. Um, we planted um, seven acres of um, Cabernet Sauvignon in 2017. And so we're waiting for those wines to come online our priority is to get the vineyard planted and established um, because people just seem to want more wine. Um, but at the same time, um, we, you know, we kind of were, were um, you know, it's, it's fits and starts. We kind of started going on things and, um, and we get, uh, we run into natural disasters. <laughs> so um, I think the fires really kind of put, um, put us, you know, a setback on everything. And then now with everything going along with COVID, um, but that doesn't mean that we can't continue to make great wine for you guys in the facility that we have. And what's amazing is that we're going to have some fantastic fruit off the, um, the fruit that's been planted on the new uh, property. So um, we will keep you guys posted. <laughs> Back to you, Jeff. Okay, back to me. Sorry, I'm, I'm trying to answer some questions. So it seems like I'm pecking at the screen. I'll stop that. Uh, I'll let you I'll let the pros do that over there. Uh, so Cabernet. We've got 15 and 16 on the docket today. So two of uh, very spectacular vintages for Napa. Um, in general, to, we had a great string uh, all the way starting in 2012, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. We were just on quite a good run there. It seemed like some of the wine critics every year were saying, oh, well, that, 
that's the new vintage of the decade. That's the new vintage of the decade. So um, I think that, uh, you know, it's debatable. I think that comes down to preference, but uh, it was very uh, advantageous to be working with Cabernet in those years. It was easy. The, the, the weather was forgiving. I don't want to say it was easy so much, but we, the weather and the song and dance that you're in with mother nature was very advantageous for making big Cabernets uh, in the snap of style. So um, Cabernet, of course, it's, it's the king of grapes. Um, it's grown everywhere in the world from Canada to Lebanon. Uh, it was probably first developed in Bordeaux in the 17th century. Uh, it's a cross of Cabernet Franc uh, and Sauvignon Blanc and uh, very famous the world over. We, we work with a number of different clones um, or have planted here and uh, over the years for, with different vineyards. Clones again are just these cuttings from certain vineyards that really have a distinctive profile. They're all genetically the same. They're all Cabernet Sauvignon. Uh, but some of the clones are basically identified and maintained in different libraries, some in Bordeaux, uh, some at UC Davis here in California. Uh, and then one of our favorite selections is also maintained. It's, it's, it's primarily been sourced from Argentina. So they all did or, or, originally come from France, but the, the uniqueness of those clones was kind of isolated in different places. Um, we tend to like to play with those. It's a nice variable. Some are a little more aromatic. Some tend to be a little more structured and it gives us a lot of tools to help us create balance and complexity the way uh, in, the, in the fashion that we envision Cabernet here. Can I uh, write for and, a minute here? Oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead. Sure, go ahead. Uh, Rach has one of my favorite um, analogies ever of like, what the hell is a clone? Do you remember, Rach? It's like the bird with the different beak based on where it lives. Or Darwinism? Or are we getting real? <laughs> you didn't make that up? <laughs> <laughs> is that me? <laughs> You're yeah. not Darwin? What? <laughs> So, yeah. Clones is such an esoteric concept, but the way you explain right. it, things I found really accessible. Yeah. You did rip off Darwin. You also put it in terms of the parent trap, right? That was a good one. What's that, what's that <laughs> one? Where, so you have, you know, the twins split up, right? One goes to England and develops an English accent because she's in England. And the other is in, well, in the modern version, Napa, ironically. You know, it has an American accent, but it's the same DNA. So, thank Jeff, you, <laughs> thank you. Is that right, Jeff? Do I get anything <laughs> left? I, lo I like it. We'll <laughs> <laughs> so, um, one of the things that people ask all the time is, like, why is Napa such a great place for Cabernet Sauvignon? Um, Cabernet, uh, because it's a later variety. So, it needs, and it's one of the more complex. Um, wines genetically in its tannin and its color and its polyphenol content. So in order to get that ripe or mature, it needs a longer growing season. Chardonnay can get ripe much earlier and it can survive in much cooler temperatures. Napa, we're very spoiled here in that we typically have a very long growing season with little frost at the start. That's very important just because if you have a lot of frost, you tend to lose vines and it damages positions and it does affect, uh, it affects quality. Uh, and then it's dry, all growing season. So we're very spoiled that way in that our, our rains normally don't return until the end of October, November, uh, if we're lucky. And the reason the rain, we don't want summer rains, we don't want fall rains too excessively because it stimulates bad things happening in the vineyard, mold, mildew, and that kind of thing. So we have this very advantageous winter, uh, window for ripening the fruit. So that's one of the, that's probably the biggest thing. The next real cool thing we, we try to um, communicate is that if you're, in, if you're in Bordeaux, they basically define terroir uh, for Cabernet and the Cabernet family on a specific soil. And, and Bordeaux is about 10 times, just a little less than 10 times the size of Napa. And in order to grow Bordeaux, you need, in Bordeaux, you need to be on the noble soil or you can't call it Bordeaux. That's kind of the, the, um, the discipline that they use there. Uh, here, so you have all of Bordeaux. It's on largely one or two soil types, basically. 
And in here in California and in Napa and specifically, we have, we say half of the soil types on the planet. So we have this great growing climate for it. And then we have this huge diverse array of soil types to get different flavors and different profiles out of. And those, those two things are completely out of the winemaking hand, winemaker's hands. We can't control those two. We can't take Cabernet grown in one soil and just twist it around and make it taste like it came from somewhere else. So we have two really important, or have been provided two really important variables from mother nature here for Cab. So that's kind of why Cabernet and California, and, and Napa specifically has become very world uh, renowned, is the ability to create complex and uh, and ripe and concentrated wines because of the weather. That's the biggest factor. Okay, two, two other quick questions, I'm gonna compile them. One is um, why this Argentinian clone that you talked about earlier? And then the other is why didn't they call it Franc Blanc instead of Cabernet Sauvignon? <laughs> who, who are they actually? Right? <laughs> right, yeah. I, you know, so Franc Blanc, yeah, that doesn't, that doesn't sound right. They must have thought ahead. They were thinking about Facebook back in this, you know, whatever, 15th century going, Franck Blanc's never going to sell, right? Cabernet Sauvignon. <laughs> so uh, I think it was taken, actually, Franck Blanc. You know? <laughs> um, uh, what was the other part of your question? Argentina. Why Argentina? Oh, Argentinian clone. Okay. So all of these, so we'll go backwards there. All of this material, all of that vine material came from Bordeaux and in, in France. It's all originated from, from Bordeaux. Over the centuries, the exportation of certain Cabernet to Argentina. Now growers there started saying, well, in these fields, we're selecting for our favorite vines. And those are the ones that are getting repropagated and they end up becoming a dominant clone even though it's still the same Cabernet that came from France, over a long time period, a distinction came, kind of was, was bred in the genetics just by selecting cuttings and replanting your vineyards over and over to those successful cuttings. So we just, the farmer just basically selected the best genetics in the field. And the grape that comes out of there tends to be a grape that doesn't have any wings or shoulders. If you could picture a Cabernet cluster. It has kind of a main body and it has a couple wings sometimes or shoulder pieces on the on the cluster. For some reason the Argentinian clone is a low yielder and it's cylindrical. It's nice and loose. It gets air through it and hundreds of years ago it emerged as this clone four largely referred to as the uh, Argentinian clone. So it's done really well here on Malveter. We really uh, really like working with that one. Uh, for people who used who have been customers of ours for a long time, we used to have the blending kits. And the blending kits were named by a soil type of where the Cabernet was grown. But if we look back on the favorite component, that was clone four. For the people, the hundreds of people who sent in and made their own custom blends, clone four was a leader in, uh, in that um, de facto survey. What was it? What was it called for the soil type? Shale. My favorite. I knew it. So the shale was actually the dirt that is, uh, well, talking about dirt here, that's the dirt that's on this property. That's the dirt that is uh, originally classified as the valley sequence. It's basically what we have in the southern part of Mount Veter is the soil that was ubiquitous in the whole valley. Uh, Mount Veter is continually being uplifted by geology. So this used to be the sedimentary material, the shale that had settled on the valley floor. It's ancient and decomposing as it gets pushed up into a mountain and it's pretty loose and well-drained. Uh, and that's the shale or the Great Valley sequence that you only find on the south, mostly on the south slopes of Mount Veter now. It used to be everywhere in the valley. It's only left because it's been covered up or eroded or, or um, you know, one other, you know, or another geological event has taken it away from other parts of Napa Valley. Can you Very talk unique about, component. Yeah. Can you talk about why that affects the wine or how it affects the flavor and the nose of the wine being on Mount so, Peter? Right. So, um, 
in any site, the soil is going to matter because of its nutrient capacities, its, its drainage. Mostly we're really thinking about drainage when we're talking about good Cabernet soils. We don't want the vines to have an abundant source of water and be very vigorous. So something that you're thinking of in your garden that looks really nice and rich and terrific for growing tomatoes or some other, not the best for growing concentrated wine grapes. So we're looking for drainage and when we go through a site, we're also doing a lot of, um, uh, we're, we're doing a lot of soil survey. So on our first four acre property, we must have dug 15, 20 holes to try to really map the variations. And one of the key things we find is the effective rooting depth. And in this soil, even though you could dig a very deep hole, the, the soil's very thin. So it's, it's two to three feet maximum where the roots could kind of penetrate and operate in. So what does that translate to with outside of wine geekery here? Uh, that we can control the vine's access to water and that's gonna help us get good color and good concentration. Am I supposed to answer that survey that just took over my screen? You probably get a lot of questions, Jeff, about the aging of wines, particularly ours. Um, we got that question today from um, one of my favorite club members, whose also birthday it is, Russell Haddock. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Um, but he has <clears throat> vintages, I think, back to 06. Should he be drinking that now? Yes, with me. I'm available. <laughs> <laughs> me too. Yeah. Okay. We'll come yeah, to we Texas. find a way to share Where that at a safe distance. <laughs> <laughs> Long straws. So, um, yes, they would be tasting great right now. Um, we try to recommend to people, if they're not used to laying down wines for a long period of time, if they really enjoy Cabernets when they're young and they're full of that concentrated fruit and they like the power and they're not, they're not really accustomed to waiting for some of those bottle age characters to, to take over or, or get integrated into the wine, then, you know, experiment, experiment slowly. If you, if you have six bottles, lay one down and say, I'm not going to open it for a while. If you have a few that you can afford to sell or start selling them, see what they're doing at five, see what they're doing at 10 years and see if that's something that suits your palate. A lot of what we're trying to do in the winery is design balance into the wines. We feel like those have the best um, uh, opportunity to age well. So we just don't want a wine that's super fruity and overripe because it's not going to age well. We want it to have a really good backbone of fruit. We want it to have good concentrated tannins and a structure that will, that will age. So that when you, if you open it day one, it's good. If you open it in day, you know, 6 million of this quarantine, it, it'll still be good. Um, what else? Other questions? Um, you know, one of the questions people had was, um, in terms of aging, since you were kind of talking about it, um, what's the difference between aging of like a um, single varietal versus a blend? Uh, it, it's really dependent on what, wholly dependent on what the variety is. Uh, Rieslings can age extremely well. People don't think of that as a real, you know, necessarily think of, they start to think red wines, big red wines age well, because we've been sort of marketed that way that, uh, you know, the tannins and things are antioxidants. We've all learned that equation a little bit. But good is good uh, white, whites with a really good acidity, those are going to age very well, too. So it really depends. Uh, there's some varieties that are really meant to be drunk and consumed very young. So a rosé, for example, no reason to lay down rosé. Structure and the way that that's formulated, that's just not a great candidate for aging. Um, that's you know, why we call you, it the pool pounder, because you need to pound it the minute you open it. <laughs> Well, elegant, yeah, pool pounder. Our club members are about to get some pool pounders sent their way, so stay tuned, guys. Well, like that, the 2010 Chardonnay, when we had that, that was just incredible. So Chardonnay can be age-worthy as well, yeah. And Cabernet, of course, because of its structure, because of um, it, just its genetically how it's, it's put together, it is very age-worthy. Cabernet blends, Bordeaux blends, generally all very age worthy. Can you talk about the barrels with Cab and how they specifically make a difference and what type of notes and flavors you expect to get out of barrel aging? 
Uh, sure. Yeah. Along the wine aging, I saw some people had some 09s and some older vintages open on the Q&A. Type in how they're tasting because I, last time we visited the 09s, those were, to me, really hitting a really beautiful spot. So, um, you know, 11 years in the bottle and the wine wasn't, uh, um, it wasn't tired at all. I mean, those wines were very well structured still and showing a beautiful new bouquet of fruit that's kind of coming along with the aging. So, um, Let's talk, like, I think it'd be great now to talk, take a minute and talk specifically about the 15 um, versus the 16 um, and maybe kind of share some of what you're getting on the nose, like as you're tasting the 15 versus the 16, all that kind of stuff. So 15 and 14, these were kind of drought years. 15, it was, um, yeah, very, very much a dry winter. Might've been one of our, it might've been the lowest, I think in, you know, ever. I think January didn't rain period or something. Uh, is what I remember. So it was very warm. It was very early. And it was a very light crop load. Because of the, the, the my theory is because of the year before we had 14 was kind of a very warm drought year. It stressed the vines pretty well. So 15, the crop for 15s developed in the fruit the year before. Every vintage is developed the year before. So um, I think the stress of 14 really limited the, the scope of the, the size of the crop for 15. That usually correlates directly into concentration. So 15 was a big vintage uh, flavor-wise. Lots of cherry, the, the aromatics were huge, and the fruit concentration was very big and upfront. We used a decent amount of Merlot to help balance that out in 15 because the wine was pretty well shouldered tannin wise. I mean, it was structured. So um, big, dark, concentrated fruit was 15. Um, compare that to 16, where we had a little more of a Goldilocks vintage where the weather, weather wise, it was just, we had a few heat waves and things, but the weather, you know, the winter was normal and good and wet and the vines woke up very happy. The crop was very solid and we could pick when we wanted to pick. The weather just was very good. 15, it was so hot that we were picking two and three weeks ahead of normal in some cases. I think the G3 vineyard let us in for Cabernet the first week of September, which is normally like the first week of October. And um, you know, older vines, they were feeling the stress quite a bit. So, uh, but the 16, things were kind of dialed in. If you said, normally we pick Cabernet the first two weeks of October, it was spot on like that. So 16 was a little more of a Goldilocks vintage. When I taste 16, I, I, I'm very partial to 16. It's, it's, it's every bit as concentrated as the 15. The tannins are just that much more balanced and elegant and long. And I get a, just a more complex layering of fruit in that wine. I'm seeing a lot of comments on there that they really like the oak and the oak tones and the, and the, the secondary aromatics in the 16 as well. So very similar barrel profile. 15 and 16. Um, you know, the barrels are natural components as well. I think a lot of people just think you plug them in. Like I use this mix and they go in, but look, the, the art of making a barrel out of a 400 year old oak tree in France, they can't all be identical. And each vintage of barrels, they, they, they are amazing at keeping them very consistent, but those two have a variability to them. So um, w for whatever reason, the, they played in a very sweet way with the 16 vintage of Cabernet. Oops, I can't hear you, Karen. I didn't. Myself. <laughs> Sorry. There she is. Hi. Um, so one of the things um, people have been asking about is our estate Cabernet. So this might be a, a nice time to talk about it. Okay. Do, are, we're not getting to taste this. Oh, Karen is. Oh. What the? Ooh, man, I need a promotion or a raise or something. Oh, Karen's got a state at the house. Mm -hmm. So very excited about our estate wine. Um, we've had a number of people ask us why, about G3 and 16 is our last vintage on G3. Um, the clones and the, the vineyard there was being pulled out. It was older. It was beautiful. It was in a great spot in that vineyard. Um, and for those of you who don't understand, when they replant, this is a five-year process before you get any fruit so 
at the same time, we were planting and designing and laying out our vineyard. So it really was just uh, sad to see the G3 go, but really helped us turn our uh, sights on the estate vineyard and developing everything here. Now, in the G3 vineyard, we basically had a couple rows and certain blocks that we really thought were primo. Here, we've got a number of different blocks and a number of different clones to build the one reserve program. So uh, a little, the matrix is that much more broad when we're working on this wine. We can, we're picking, basically going through and picking best parts of the vineyard, as well as picking best barrels out of those lots. And we're kind of distilling those all into our reserve. So Karen's showing off the new label. We just finished creating our new label. You guys are the happy first with all ones that. to see it. This is literally the so, first time we've ever showed it. So, so a nice little plug for Soda Rock's uh, design. Ellen out there designed this. She's a terrific graphic designer and did our label. A cool F medallion and um, nice sleek uh, update, refresh on the Fontanella brand. So we're, we're really excited when we get these out. I don't even know when they're coming out. I didn't even know Karen was allowed to open that, by the way. It's not open. Oh, well. You see the cool little end of it. I just have a bottle to show off. But we'll be we'll we'll talk more about it over time as uh, as we get closer to the release. So I just are thought we it was opening. Are we opening that after this chat? Are we all coming up to the kitchen and we're just gonna crack that? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Come I don't know if it's ready. It needs it needs so it. It's really sleep. <laughs> so a little about the estate vineyard. The way we have it laid out, we actually have five different clones that we're working with, and each one kind of brings um, by design a little different element, whether it's again, aromatics or it's structure. And uh, it's really fun getting to see how those are developing in the vineyard. And um, they're very different. And so having those elements, having those components to try to build something. This part of Napa, so this, the Southern Slopes of Mount Vitor, I mean, this is what Ka Karen and I really envisioned when we, you know, 15 plus years ago, we're searching for a property. We really thought this is the type of soil this is the type of exposure this is the type of climate we really want to work with because it's going to help us bring cabernets to the table that aren't overblown ripe but still have very good fruit and they have a backbone of acidity and tannin that is balanced they're not they're not kind of too too far flung in one category or another so we were really envisioning balance and we want to all these components like the clones and the barrels and such are are the are the components that go into building complexity. So balance and complexity is really the goal there. And um, yeah, well, I, we're excited about when those come out. Well, I, think, I, I might run up to the house right now. And open that <laughs> <thing>. <laughs> so I think, you know, it's, it's um, this wine's in particular very, very special for Jeff and I, because um, we've, you know, we've been making wine for a number of years now. Um, but what's special about the um, estate reserve is that it's, it's a wine that we've made from, I mean, it's very inception. Like it's truly our baby because we started from, you know, back in 2005, you know, when we were looking at buying this property and we were digging holes to, to have our, you know, geologists and all the experts decide, like, is this a place that we could Ant Cabernet is this the right spot for us and we love Mount Veeder and so um, it was it was really since then that we really um, started um, really beginning the dream of the winery and um, and so being able to take you know from soil pits to um, you know deciding what varietals and what clones and what you know um, rootstock and and every bit of the process has been so uniquely ours and and when I say ours I really mean Jeff because I don't really know much <laughs> compared to him <laughs> but um, but it's really a, um, something that that's that's ours from the very beginning and I I think it's unique and special and um, and for us it's the first time that we can really bring something that from from the very beginning is really ours. And, um, and so we will be releasing it this year. Um, I think with um, the COVID-19 will be probably a little bit delayed, um, but we wanna bring it out to you guys. It's something special. And, and um, it's interesting that our brand relaunch and the launch of our state Cabernet is kind of in this new time. And I think it's, um, it's gonna be a, a, a new world for us, but, um, but I think better. Um, I think when we come out of all this, we'll think about um, the, the better parts of it. And so, um, so we're excited about this and sorry. You've been totally upstaged by your dog, Hobie. So unfortunately, <laughs> I just have to let 
have to let you know that and also ask what Hobie's favorite vintage would be had she been alive for longer than nine months. Shit, there's a page behind me. <laughs> um, what would her favorite be? I don't know. Hobie's definitely, you know, a daddy's girl. So she's what? probably good, right? No, she is my dog. That's what she told me. Bitter debate, guys. Welcome, welcome to the main <laughs> debate at the Fontanella Wine Headquarters. The dogs love me better. I feed them. But she's kind of new school. I don't, I don't know. If she sides with me, she might go 16. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So um, what other questions do we have? Let's see. Uh, there were some questions about uh, how does France maintain oak trees 400 years old, that kind of thing. Um, I, I'm probably a little off the mark saying 400 years old, but they're certainly over 200. Um, it sounds cool when you say 400. Maybe that's why I said it that way. But uh, they're, they're, the, the, the trees are very old when, you are, um, uh, when they're harvesting. The French government maintains all of the forests there, and they're all sold at auction. Uh, so it's a very um, well thought out, well controlled process. Um, uh, you know, so that somehow they've figured out how to keep the quality and keep the um, keep the supply in check, so they don't run out. Uh, for a lot of people, they have questions about American oak and French oak. And what's the difference? Um, American oak is a is a very closely related species, but a different species, and the main, in my mind, the main thing that's different about the two, because it, they're usually asking about why is French oak more expensive. To me, French oak just seems to be a little softer and more integrated. And when we're dealing with wines that already have a lot of structure, integration is kind of key. When we have a, a wine like Zinfandel that doesn't have as much structure naturally, we want to give it a little more extract. Um, and the American oak, for me, it seems to pair up better with that. It kind of helps fortify the backbone of the wine. Um, the main difference in price really is the French oak species has to be hand split on grain or it leaks. The, the American oak can be cut by different, you know, machinery. So, and you can yield so much more out of the tree. So uh, they can get a lot more out of one tree with the American oak than they can out of the French oak. That's the okay. best explanation I ever got. Uh, okay, a quick thing. I just, for those of you who actually uh, voted in the last poll, thank you. I wanted to point out, because some people might not have the poll. Um, so the question that we said was, what is the Fontanelle tradition to celebrate the last of the harvest fruit coming in um, at the end of Crush? And so I just wanted to share quickly what we do. So at the beginning of harvest every year, we bless the grapes with champagne. So at the beginning of harvest, when the fr first fruit comes in, I mean, we've done it from day one in 2008. Um, we ha crack open a bottle of champagne, um, we toast and um, bless the grapes and, um, and drink champagne. And sometimes it happens to be at seven o'clock in the morning, but we still do it because that's what we're supposed to do. <laughs> um, but at the end Don't of- Don't break tradition. What was that? Don't break tradition. You can't break tradition. So from the first year, I think, you know, the first year was right when the economy had tanked and, um, and we had our first harvest and we had every bump in the road. And it was just Jeff and one cellar guy um, who did the entire crush. Um, so, I mean, it was a lot of hard work um, for Jeff in particular. Um, we had a really lean staff and, um, and I had two little babies at home. Um, and so by the end of harvest, we were like, damn, we really need some tequila. And so, <laughs> so we started a tradition that uh, when the last fruit comes in, we always have tequila. And <laughs> we started having a party called um, Font Tequila Friday. Um, and we invited kind of our industry folks and people who understand uh, the pain of harvest and the joy. But, um, but we always have tequila and, uh, and tacos. Um, but that side note, I know people voted for Cabernet and Carne Asada as also. Um, when the crew is done, um, before we have the big party, we do actually have Cabernet with Carne Asada. Octavio, our Octavio. That's, oh, guys. that's when we put the crusher away. So harvest, we still have fermentation going in and all this stuff to do. But once the crusher gets put away, Cab and Carne Asada. Yep. <laughs> so if you voted for either of those, they're correct. <laughs> That's when I know that this was my home. I joined <laughs> right at, at harvest, and I was like, what? <laughs> right, people. 
Yeah, nobody nobody can beat Tavio's carne asada, the best in Napa or California or <laughs> for that matter. Well, you have to understand, like literally it's the end of harvest. We've been working like 18 hour days, like everyone's just exhausted. And I just, my heart glows when uh, Tavio and Rigo come up to the house to, gra to get the barbecue, <laughs> take it to the winery. And he's like, okay, I'm going to get the meat. And like all of us just like freak, everyone who's not working that day will still come into work and everyone just, you know. It it's really a, is the highlight of the year. It certainly <laughs> is. It certainly is. <laughs> All right, we just got a few more minutes left. So um, any other questions? This is your chance. Um, let's see. One of the questions is, is that, um, are you going to continue to make Vext offer? Um, I, I won't say never, but uh, at the moment, we, we're, we, don't, we won't be having any more Vext offer for a while. So. We don't have any contracts on the fruit and, um, you know, it's solid fruit, but, uh, I, th I think we're, uh, turning our attention and our, our, our sites on our estate stuff. So, and you guys, you guys will be really happy with that. Yeah. So, oh wait, I have, I have a question. <laughs> I'm gonna put Caroline on the spot. <laughs> What's your favorite part about working with Jeff? <laughs> ooh, ooh, I got, it. I'm listening. <laughs> that's like what's your favorite part about being here um, yeah. <laughs> um i guess i mean y'all y'all can i mean listening to him talk you know you it's it's obvious he's super knowledgeable um so i guess that's probably been the best the best um thing that i've gotten to you know be able to work with the crew is that you know jeff's got a lot of a lot of knowledge and yeah it's been it's been great <laughs> <laughs> All right, cool. Um, any other questions you we'll have? How long can you lay the 16 down for? Well, I, I mean, all these, all these vintages, I think, are very good candidates for laying down 10 years plus, no problem. Um, you know, what's going to be ideal? I don't know. We'll have to kind of check in and see. But my, my guess is that this wine will show really well. Uh, 15 20 years out no problem awesome all right so and um, we've just got a few more minutes left um do you guys see any other questions that probably need to be answered I do, and this is a popular one jeff when are you going to make that fountain eladro again because it's goddamn delicious <laughs> So for those of you who don't know what the santo is uh um, and why and why it's called that uh, so I'm going there. Yeah, Santo is um, Santo de Yadra means the Saint of Thieves. So we kind of came up with that um, that title as a, a it was kind of an unorthodox barrel blend. We're literally we're going through the cellar and we're kind of picking this and picking that uh, and stealing barrels from uh, their their normal destined blends, and uh, we called it Santo de Yadra. The other the double meaning there, Santo was my great grandfather. He is the one who brought the fontanellas over the pond and um you know is the reason i guess i'm here so it's a little homage to my uh the fontanella family and their uh he had the first vineyard in, uh, for fontanellas on my family tree i think in connecticut he had some vines growing on uh on his home there is the legend that's great well, people are excited. So Santo, are we doing Santo again? Uh, we are doing Santo again. It will be bottled and released, let's see, probably next year if you behave, especially you. I don't know who I'm pointing at. Jennifer. It's always Jennifer. It's always Jennifer. <laughs> so yeah, we do have another Santo in the works for all of you. We, we, we know it's been popular. So it's a cab, Merlot, Zin, Petit Sirah. We, we make a really fun red blend that's um, age worthy to an extent, more than Zinfandel on that spectrum. And, uh, but still has a lot of fresh upfront fruit and um, pairs well with a lot of different foods. Awesome. And so one, one last question people, a lot of people are asking about as the new, the new um, label and the logo and everything. Um, yes. Um, for all of you wondering, is there going to be um, 
different swag items and t-shirts and wine glasses. And yes, we will be having our new logo on everything. So if you have something with our, um, our old logo, um, those are going to be great collector's items because those are something, and I just envision one day, you know, you know, God willing, maybe our children will be like resurrecting the original label. But um, in the meantime, um, the new label will have um, all sorts of stuff for you guys to have. Um, and there's one of my kids back there. There's John. Hi, John. <laughs> and again, our club members are going to be the first to see it in person. The um, the May shipment, which is going to go out as the Chardonnay and Rosé features the new label. So it's the first time we're kind of sending the little babies out into the world. So that's something to look forward to, to see it in person. Jeff, look what your dog's doing. Is oh, it is his dog, dog now? Get off the couch. He's not supposed to be on the couch. <laughs> <laughs> I do All that right. with my husband and my daughter, and I'm like, that's what your daughter is doing. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, so with that, I think we're going to start to wrap things up a little bit. Um, but I know last year, last week, um, we had such a great um, response and everything. Um, so Jennifer is going to talk a little bit about some things that we've got going on um, with uh, specials and whatnot. So I'll hand it over. And how blue are my teeth, everyone? Is it bad? Does everyone else have blue teeth? I don't know. It's bad. I feel like I have very porous teeth. Um, okay. I wanted to talk about some fabulous Fontanella specials for you to enjoy at home because that's where we all are living, basically. Um, so the first thing is not new. It's the tasting kit. If you've had a trip that's canceled, um, if you've got a friend that needs just to lift up, if you want to uh, relive your visit, it's everything you would experience in a box just without the dogs and the zany personality. So it's four bottles. It's Chardonnay. It's the Rebob. It's the Zin. It's the Cab. Um, there's a beautiful set of paperwork uh, with photos and descriptors and stuff like that. So it's a great way to sort of bring a little bit of Fontanelle home for you. It's $189. Shipping is included. And our club members get their discount on that. So that's a great thing to bring home to you. It's a great thing to send as a gift. Um, secondly, and this I am most excited about, is that our next planned webinar is on Friday, May 8th. And what we're gonna do is compare and paste the two vintages of Mount Meter Cab that I've heard Jeff talk about, like the second coming of Jesus Christ. So that would be the 2008 and the 2016. And so we just launched this afternoon and put it on our website. Cause a lot of you've been asking for this. You wanna taste what we're tasting while we taste it. So um, there's a two pack, the 08 and the 16 Mount Meter Cab. It's $200. Shipping's included. That's actually a massive discount on what the actual price of the wine is. And club members can also get their discount on top of that. So if you want to join us on a Friday, May 8th and taste what we're tasting, get your order in by the latest at um, April 22nd, as Rachel knows, because she's the one that's handling all your shipping. Everything is bonkers out there right now. Coronavirus has absolutely impacted our ability to like pack and ship wine too efficiently. So get it in ASAP, your order, and you'll see it if you go to our website now. I think it's called the, what do we call it, Rach? The Zoom Cab, Zoom cab Duo. Duo. Zoom the Cab Duo. It's on the website. So order that now. Order it no later by the 22nd and then come back here. Um, wherever here is for you on Friday, May 8th, and we'll send out information about that tasting at that time. Um, and then we still have the stock up promo going. So if you wanted to get a tasting kit, you wanted to get a Zoom Cab Pro Duo, Zoom Cab Duo, and then buy some more wines too. If you use the promo code stock up when you check out, um, every three bottles you add in addition to that, it's just $1 shipping. <sighs> I did it, you guys. I did it. <laughs> Um, we've, I just want to add to that is that we've also gotten a couple of requests to when you open your bottles to contact one of us and we can do, um, zoom tastings with you but, or FaceTime tastings with you. That's true. So if you, if you order something you want, yes. a font of babe of your choice, we cannot guarantee you FaceTime with Karen and or Jeff, but I'm fairly confident we can deliver a me, a Carol Ann, a Rachel or a Paige. If you want, you know, a little a little FaceTime with us and a little tasting with us, let us know. We can, I mean, we can probably make that work. I got a little Burt Reynolds here. Yeah. <laughs> See? 
All right. Well, um, hopefully you guys can all join us on May 8th. Um, it'll be a great tasting. It'd be really fun to be tasting the same wines um, with you, um, with Jeff. And those are two classic varietals. So when you um, when we talk about the pricing, the 08 is a library wine. So we don't um, openly sell that. Um, that's why it's a really unique special opportunity. We only have a finite amount of it left. So we have a limited number of these packages. Um, so get your order in if you want to be tasting along with us. Um, but we'll send more information about joining us to that call that webinar but um, you don't necessarily need those wines to taste with us like you can certainly come and join us have the 16 wine or just have whatever you have with us and just hear Jeff talk about it so um, with that being said um, thank you guys all so much for joining us it's been so much fun for us um, to have this Friday um, afternoon to spend time with each of you and um, and we thank each of you for um, for participating for being part of our Fontanella extended family um, and for being so supportive to us um, during everything that we've been through and we're we're here for you um, whenever you guys need us. So thank you, and we will see you guys hopefully on May 8th. Thanks for coming, everyone. Bye, guys.